This is Scott Richmond and Arnie Sherman. You're listening to What Do You Know on News Talk KGVO, AM 1290 and 98.3 FM. Arnie, Arnie, Arnie. Scott, good morning. Good morning to you. How are you today? I feel like I'm losing control of my environment and the world we live in. How come? Well, you know, over the past few weeks, we've had some very interesting topics, including cryptocurrency, which is, you know, hard to understand. It sort of boggles your mind. Yep. And I was talking to one of my dear friends uh, this week about his son. His son is getting cancer treatment. His son has leukemia. He's getting cancer treatment, and he said he opened one of the bills, one of many bills that came in, and it was $268,000. You're kidding me. No. And he said, thank God we have health insurance. Right. And we have a very generous health insurance plan because he works for a big company. And I said to myself, what would you do? What would a parent do who did not have such coverage or didn't have any coverage at all, and, and their kid had... Leukemia or some disease like that. What do you do? Deny him, or do you? You know, I mean, you can't even go in debt for hundreds and hundreds. It's impossible to think about it. It, it that really way. is. It's shocking, and so it, it is. It, it led me to think about how screwed up our healthcare system is in the United States. You know, we are one of the worst performing health systems in a developed nation. You know, we have one of the we have the most expensive. We have probably the lowest efficiency. We have, um, we rank 37th in health care. In the free world. Yeah. We spend more than any other country. Sure. You know, our national drug prices are unsustainably high. In fact, I took a look in between 2008 and 2014, uh, Drug prices in the United States went up 127% in six years. And in a country like England, they went up 11%. And, you know, all these questions beg the answer, why? Why is our cost so high? Why is our system so inefficient? You know, and the U.S. life expectancy is going down. Really? We're 26th in the world. How can it be going down? You know, we, we eat a Our lot parents of are, are, we eat a lot of Cheetos. I don't know. I'm just <laughs> I'm just saying that, that you know facts are stubborn things, and when you take a look at where we rank in in terms of right. health, in terms of cost, in terms of you know infant mortality, in terms of life expectancy, you know, in terms of things like opioid epidemics and all of these kinds of things, we're in a pretty awful situation for a country that prides itself on being a world leader. We certainly are not a world leader in, in healthcare, and so I'm anxious he, to hear from our guest today, Jeff Fee, who's a, you know who's a senior healthcare executive with 20 years experience. Up until recently, he was CEO of the Western uh, Region for Providence Healthcare. Um, I don't know anybody else who is more of a go-to guy to ask these kinds of questions and to try to get some handle on exactly why we're in the situation you know we're in why we don't have a single payer system which seems to be you know one right. of the you know one of the advantages of health containment and negotiating uh, lower prices is to have a have a system in which uh, it's it's the government negotiating with or one or one company negotiating with the pharmaceutical companies right. and negotiating with the suppliers instead of the way we have it now i think uh, you know, the proof is in the pudding. We have the most expensive system. There's no way to contain it. Dabbling with uh, the Affordable Care Act is not making anything any better. It's going to make it worse. Right. And I don't see any, you know, light at the end of the tunnel for, you know, improving the, the, the conditions in the situation. Maybe Jeff does. Well, that's why we're going to have him on and we're going to ask him these questions. No, I think Jeff is a great guest, and we've had him on before when we were doing, uh, when he was at St. Pat's. Right. And I know now he's the CEO of a new startup. We'll talk to him a little bit about that. Uh, and Jeff's just a great, warm guest. And I'm looking forward to having this conversation with him. As am I. Uh, you are listening to What Do You Know? Proudly supported and sponsored by Angle & Volker's Luxury Real Estate and uh, Dawn Maddox. We'll be back after this with Jeff Fee. All right, Arnie, we are back with Jeff Fee. Jeff, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. We wanted someone who had all the answers 
and knew the future for healthcare, and so we thought it would be good to get you here. Well, I, I will disappoint you in that regard. <laughs> I, I, I no, can no. assure you. You know, <laughs> give give us, you know, from from your you know perspective, spending twenty years as a you know a CEO in in the healthcare system. What you know, what's your report card? What's the state of American healthcare at the moment? It is a mess. It's a mess on many, many fronts. I can state we can start with the obvious that it's obviously unsustainable when it comes to the current current cost trends. And we can get into the discussion around what drives the cost, but it is incredibly difficult to navigate. It is fragmented at many levels. Um, it is focused on volume still, even though that there's starting to be some payment mechanisms that start to reward value. So it the the incentives that are currently in the uh, system, whether it's from the provider level or insurance level, aren't aligned with what Americans are asking for out of the healthcare system. And as long as those incentives exist, uh, we're not going to see any demonstrable or, or meaningful change. Well, how did we get in this situation? I mean, most people, it's sort of a, a fractured scenario in a way. Most people think the American doctors are great. American medical schools are great. American pharmaceutical companies are great. We have a lot of smart researchers doing all kinds of great stuff. how the system get so messed up? Well, to, to answer, well, let me, let me start here. We do have great doctors. We do have great pharmaceutical companies. We have incredible researchers. We have the best rescue care in the world. If you get in a car wreck, you have a heart attack, you ski into a tree, there's not a better system in the face of the planet that's going to do a better job getting you and saving your life. Some would argue that we have the best cancer care in the world. Um, how we ended up here with as fragmented as it, as it is, is a, um, you could probably write a doctoral thesis on that. It's a very complex, but it starts with um, when you go back to the advent of Medicare when it came into existence, how Medicare reimbursed and how Medicare incentivized the provider community. I'm just. I'm mainly going to be speaking to this from the mm -hmm. provider community standpoint. Right. That'd be good. I'm a business guy. I got my first job as a chief executive north of Nashville in Hendersonville, and I'm you know I'm thinking about you know the dollars and cents of running a business, and I found out that we're giving flu shots at a funeral home. We're giving them away free. I'm like number one. Why are we giving flu shots at a funeral home? Well, it's like it's good publicity. Well, if it's going to be good publicity, why wouldn't we be doing flu shots? in my hospital where we're getting top billing for the publicity. But secondly, when you think about this, giving a hospital giving a flu shot is like a tavern owner having an AA meeting in their bar <laughs> yeah, right. during happy hour. Right. We get paid to take care of sick people. So I was actually on a, an investor call one point in time, and the, the, uh, investor, the investment analysis analyst was asking why we'd had such a good first quarter. And the answer was because we had a great flu season. Now, from a business standpoint, a lot of people getting flu is where you make your money. But mm -hmm. from a public health standpoint, that's obviously a terrible thing. Right. So I'm just highlighting the fact that the incentives exist right now. We're paid to take care of sick people. The more sick people we take care of, the better we're going to do. As opposed to keep, keeping people out of the hospital and out of the doctor's office. Who pays for that? Right. You're, I right. mean, it's like it's preventative. Keeping, it's keeping the person out of your bar. Your right. bar owner is like, no, 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 right. don't right. come in here and drink the beer. Right. So it is. It's a system that is built upon perverse, perverse incentives, and that's part of the, That is one of the biggest issues that we face. And until you fundamentally change the incentives, you're not going to change a lot about the structure of the healthcare system. Most of the wealthy countries in the world have universal health care. Should we have universal health care? I so. To answer your question, in the richest country in the world, the, the fact that we are debating whether or not kids have should have access to basic health care is is a head scratcher to me. Mm -hmm. Everybody, everybody that that comes into this country, born in this country, should have access to some basic health care. Should it be offered? Uh, are, are you asking about a single payer system? Well, that's the per that would be the next question after this: a single payer system. But universal health care, we're in agreement we should have, particularly for kids. Right. How you finance it is where you're going to get into the debate. Okay. Because and what's your what's your particular take on on single payer system? Um, we have a single payer system for people that are over 65. Right. It's called Medicare, and I would submit that, and we're going to get into this discussion. I assume. Um, that Medicare is part of the problem with the American healthcare system. Medicare does not cover 
in like in my in my previous setting in the hospitals medicare doesn't cover its cost so this whole concept of cost shifting is a huge factor when it comes to the overall cost of health care. Well, is it just our version of it? Because other countries like Canada, UK, and others have a single-payer system. They are, are, is, is their system not covering the cost either? Uh, their system do cover the cost, but their system is, is um, rationed. Mm-hmm. You're going to get in line if you don't, if you don't have a non-life-threatening uh, situation. So you hear about people having to wait six months, a year, two years to get a total knee. That's because they've limited the actual size of the system and access hmm. to the system. Right. Try pulling that off on an American. Right. Right. We do want it mean, now. Our, exactly. Our society right. would not accept that kind of. But in places like Canada, there is still also private health care providers who, that you could go to if you wanted to. I know that's a cost-related issue, but it, it's a single-payer system, but there are other alternatives there. Yeah, and a lot of them come to the, uh, to the United, States. United States or right. Mexico or, or you know other That's places exactly that right. they go where they may be. If able you have to enough money to pay for your own health care, you're going to go to the best. So you'll go to New York, you'll go to L.A., you'll go wherever. That's exactly right. Okay, I, I'm gonna, so. we'll come back to this, but let, let's talk about uh, prescription drug costs. Yes, you know I, I mentioned in the lead in ours have gone up 127 percent over maybe a six year period, while a country like the U.K. only has gone up about 11 percent. Why Why is my prescription of Eliquis $300 is the cheapest I can buy it here, and I can go to Canada and get it for $100? Well, I'm sure somebody from pharma would argue with me, but I will start, and this is my opinion. Number one, pharma is one of the most powerful lobbies in D.C. Uh, number two, the government, the U.S. government has allowed pharma to amortize research and development on the backs of the American public because we want our drugs and we want them now. Mm-hmm. And the ultimate, at the end of the day, the Canadian government isn't going to allow mm. those pharmaceutical companies, and they want access to those markets. And as long as we, as consumers, and the, our government allow them to charge, they will continue to do so. Right. So they charge more here because they can get more, and they charge less in Canada because Canada restricts the cost. That's exactly right. So an offshoot of this question that just po- you know, comes to my mind is, is the opioid epidemic in the United States. Do the pharmaceutical companies, I know they're supposedly controlled on how much opioid medication they produce. Are they producing too much? Uh, are they producing more than they should produce? Is there enough control over that? Because you, know, you keep reading and reading and reading, and we all probably know people who are victims of you know opioid addiction. Right. What, what's happening there? I mean, it's supposed to be controlled. It's supposed to be limited. It, there's supposed to be some assessment of how many people really need it and how many. I mean, there's some general guidelines, yet it seems to be there's a, you know, an overabundance of prescription medication available. That's right. Well, if you look, so I'm going to, if you'll allow me this uh, yes. analogy. If you go back into the 70s and the, the, the uh, food pyramid mm-hmm. that was promulgated by the FDA back right. in the 70s, what did that do to, American, to the American public? Made us fat. Yeah, obese. Made us obese. It was founded upon faulty science, and ultimately they've changed the food pyramid, and they'll change it again. I can't remember exactly when, but they started tying, uh, Medicare Medicaid started tying um, payment or performance metrics into patient experience, which is a good thing, right? Mm -hmm. Well, one of those was pain scale. So they they implemented this thing called a pain scale, and they have these smiley faces all the way up to somebody crying, and they have to assess your pain. And part of how ho- hospitals and doctors get rated is how well they manage pain. And pain is real, but it's also subjective. Mm-hmm. And if somebody knows that they can rate themselves a seven and they're likely to walk out with a prescription versus a four and not, um, and <clears throat> they get a lot of the doctors get a lot of pressure. So it's too available. You're saying it's too available, and the government put incentives to the into the provider community mm. to aggressively manage pain. Mm. So what I'm talking mm. of the analogy with the food pyramid, it was it was done with good intentions, but it had far-reaching unintended consequences. Mm. That's what we're dealing mm. with right well, now. Okay. As, as you know, every time you read about some <clears throat> high-profile person dying of drug overdose, right. it's inevitable that you find out they had 57 prescriptions and that multiple doctors were writing them scripts for the same kinds of you know medication, and there was no central way... To right. monitor and did you ever have that. to uh, you know offshoot of that? Did you ever have to handle that in your your former job when docs were 
overly, you know, writing too many scripts and. We you know, actually had a very progressive medical staff uh-huh. uh, in Providence here in Western Montana, and when it started becoming a problem, we actually our medical group enacted through its own self governance some oversight in terms of the, of the prescription patterns for physicians. Mm-hmm. But it, getting back, Arnie, to your point earlier, part of what I said in the lead in, my leading comments was the fragmented nature of healthcare. Back in the seventies, I think it was the U.S. government standardized what a banking transaction looked like. And now you can take your ATM card, you can travel with a high degree of confidence really anywhere in the world to walk up to an ATM and get your money out. We don't have a standard language or a standard mechanism for defining what a healthcare transaction looks like. And so even though I might have, I have Epic, we had Epic within Providence, Mm -hmm. but it's Providence's version of Epic. Sister to Charity Leavenworth, the other Catholic system in the state, as Epic, we would actually have to create, it's a low cost, but we would have to create an interface Face. for those two to talk to each other. So uh, some of this stuff can be remedied through policy by actually having a universal language for how electronic medical records, mm. it's called intraoperability, talk to each other. That's one of the reasons why it's possible for people to shop doctors because a lot of times, and it's getting better, with the advent of more standard electronic medical records. But in the absence of that local registry, um, physicians don't know who's being prescribed with what. Now, I mean, the the retail chains are starting to put safeguards in place to keep people from abusing the system Mm -hmm. because it has become a crisis. So things are being done to rectify the situation, but it fundamentally comes back down to what were the incentives that were, were, uh, we were putting in front of the providers, and that was manage, aggressively manage your patient's pain got out of control without really any mechanism to communicate amongst providers to manage those situations for when they were uh, doctor shopping. So if the American healthcare system was a patient, is this patient treatable or is this patient going to have to die (laughs) and you're going to have to have a new patient to work on? You know, that's a great question. And I don't, um, I don't want to be overly dramatic about it. Part of the problem with the perpetuation of the current model is there's so much money in it, and the big players have so much to lose, even with small changes to the system. And so even though I think individually all this, all the players would like to see meaningful change, when you bring it to the masses as a whole, it becomes a process of self-protectionism. Every component wants to protect their individual components. And at the end of the day, you've got lawmakers that really don't understand the delivery of healthcare in the first place, that are making decisions not based upon what, that are informed relative to the healthcare, but they're making decisions based upon what? Politics. politics. And right now, partisan politics. Mm-hmm. And you just don't normally see meaningful, good, healthy, sustainable change that we really need uh, coming out of that situation. So I'm relatively um, non optimistic about um, seeing meaningful change. Well, what, what um, I think infuriates me when I look at it as a non-healthcare expert is, you know, the, the constant criticism, of, for example, of the American, you know, uh, the ACA and uh, the Affordable Care Act, but not any kind of system to look as another model or an alternative, you know, to it that would improve the things that people are most concerned about. Right. I mean, how, how bad is the Affordable Care Act. It has the changes that have been made by the current administration made it any better, made it worse, made it different? I mean, if, if, if you're talking to a consumer out there, what do you say to them about the current state of the system that they're, they're asked to participate in? So, sure. So, I'm, just gonna, and I'm probably going to omit some things just because we're talking off the cuff here. Right. We're just having this a conversation. Not a prepared presentation. No, no. When not. you think about what good came out of the Affordable Care Act, the fact of the matter is, is that pre- people with pre existing conditions cannot be de- denied coverage. On a humanistic level, that's how, great. I mean, that's great. Right. It's great. Whereas before they couldn't. Um, the, the fact that you, they've got better access to health care options is a good thing. Um, where, the, where it kind of fell apart was in some of the requirements for how the individual market worked and didn't work. So the lack, and this is a piece that the, that the Republicans have fundamentally repealed 
through the tax reform is the individual mandate. They took the tax penalty away out of current tax code. Right. The individual mandate was, in my opinion, part of the problem. Not because it existed, it because it existed without significant enough teeth. And there, you couple that with the lack of a continuous coverage requirement. There are stories that are true stories about people that created a special enrollment process for themselves by moving and changing zip codes when they found out that they had hmm. they needed a liver transplant or a kidney transplant. You can't get on the transplant waiting list without having insurance. So they figured out what the rules of the game were. They changed their physical address, created a special enrollment system for them, got on the waiting list, paid six months worth of premiums, had a $250,000 surgery, then stopped paying the premiums. Right. And that was not the intention of... That was not the intention, but if you start thinking about the implications of being people being able to jump on and jump off at will, it's analogous to um, the forest fires in Santa Monica. Right. All right, so you have a house, you don't have homeowner's insurance. And all of a sudden you got a right. fire running down the hill at your house. You think you're going to be able to pick up the phone and call State Farm and get insurance to cover your house from that fire? No. That's exactly what we're allowing to have happen at the American healthcare system. With the, with the current within within the current Affordable Care Act, I don't think it was intentional. Right, that's one of the things that. Or removing work. the individual mandate hasn't changed that, has it? It's going to make it worse. That's right. That's what. I, right, their push to amend the Affordable Care Act, Obamacare, right. Right. is going to make it worse. That's right, because you need everybody in the yeah. risk pool. Yeah, and if you don't have everybody in the risk pool, the risk pool is fundamentally going to deteriorate because the young invincible 27-year-olds mm. aren't going to pay the money to get the health care insurance. You need the healthy people in with the sick people in order to make the math work. So, Plain and simple. So you're in charge of U.S. health policy. Oh, dear. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you're working for Tom Price. Tom Price tells you, <laughs> you know, make, make the changes that, that are needed, the big picture changes that are needed. What do you think those are? Well, I've always said that if you're really going to make meaningful reform in the healthcare system, it comes in the form of a three-legged stool. And the three legs to that stool are, number one, you have to pay uh, the provider community differently, and you have to align the incentives. An example that I like to talk about is called the Program for the All-Inclusive Care of the Elderly. It's a PACE program. If you like to join a PACE program, you turn all, all of your Medicare benefits over, and the PACE program is responsible for... Um, all of your medical care and your housing if you're not living at home. Oh, huh? interesting. So this lady's family comes in one day and says, Mom fell and broke her hip, and we're going to have to move her, move her to her nursing home. Why is that? Because her house is an ADA compliant. Well, what did the PACE program do? The PACE program is going to spend, what, seven, eight, nine thousand dollars $9,000 a month with that lady in a nursing home? You think she wants to be in a nursing home? No, they sent two carpenters out to the house, spent 15000 bucks, retrofitted the house, and kept her at home because that's where the incentive is. It's just an elegant example of how when you align the incentives the right way, all of a sudden, not only mm. induce, introduce human right. element to the overall equation, you do the right things economically. By the way, in these PACE programs that I've been exposed to, 9 out of 10 of the patients have advanced directives that avoid fetal care at the end of life because they themselves... And the family members understand the progression of the disease they have mm. or their condition. And they typically, when asked the question, do you want to pass away peacefully, surrounded by your loved ones at home, or in a Hail Mary with needles sticking out of your arm in an intensive care unit? Ten percent of the people want the Hail Mary, but the other ninety percent. Uh, I no. want the banana cream pie, you know. <laughs> but no, but this is we've this is a conversation we had the other day about the more you know about who you are and your health and uh, and the more informed you are, better the be decisions you better make. decisions you make. Let's do a quick ID. Our guest is Jeff Fee. We're talking all things health care here on What Do You Know, proudly supported and sponsored by Angle and Volker's Luxury Real Estate. Arnie. So, okay, we, I like that one. That's a good change. Right. What else you got for us? Uh, the second leg to the stool yep. is uh, provider or the uh, delivery system reform. We fundamentally have to switch the emphasis away from, we can't walk away from being the best rescue care. We're used to it. We expect it. We all want it for our loved ones. But we have solely focused on that, and we have not focused as much as we could on prevention. If you look at the, if you look at the model really needs to shift to a primary care focus model where the primary care physicians are incentivized to keep people out of the hospital appropriately by addressing 
health. I often talk about the fact when people talk about who's my primary health care provider, I'll say me, my wife, and my personal trainer. <laughs> right. Because at the end of the day, one of the most important medicines you put in your body is the food that you eat and how you exercise. And you can change a lot with that. But if you look at the current system, physicians, I mean, how much, how many thousands, hundreds of thousands of dollars do they rack up uh, to go into medical school? We want the best and the brightest going into medical school. Why should they come out and have to pay pauper wages? We, we, they don't. So they get plugged into the system where they're churned and burned, and the physicians, the primary care physicians, fundamentally don't have the, the time in the current reimbursement model to focus on really, truly understanding what's going on with you hmm. so that they can fundamentally change it versus just putting prescriptions at your way and treating right. symptoms. Sure. Well, one of, the, one of the compliments I want to give you as a former CEO here at Providence, I always felt that in, in my life, I you know, lived in New York and Chicago and Kansas City and Washington, D.C. I never saw a system work as efficiently and responsively as, as the Providence system here. I mean, I went into, I, I only used the emergency room once in my life, and it was here. And I, I went in at 3 o'clock in the morning, and I was hooked up and had a doctor in the room in under four minutes. If yeah. I was in Chicago, I'd still be in the car waiting to get into the building. We had, we had and have an incredible team of caregivers here in Western Montana. There is no doubt about it. And that's one of the reasons why I decided to officially from running hospitals, because I knew that I would never had it better, <laughs> never have it better than I had at St. Pat's, no. and so it would only be downhill. It was terrific. Right. Third leg of the stool. One that is not very popular to talk about. All right. Personal accountability. <laughs> And you're staring right at me. <laughs> no, no. I well, I, you're, you're the one asking me the questions. <laughs> I know, I know, I know. <laughs> no, but what does that mean? When you, when you think about how you treat your body, if you smoke, there has to be some reconciliation around personal choice and personal accountability. You can't truly reform a system without having some level of personal accountability in the equation, whether that comes in the form of a t- another level of tobacco tax. If you smoke, you got to pay more for right. your health insurance. Well, I noticed, in, in, and they probably have it here, although I, I, I'm remiss in, in knowing all the details, but I know in New York City and other places, in the public school systems, they're trying to implement healthier lunches and, you know, education, you know, for, for young people about being healthy. And, you know, the, the Mayor Bloomberg got a lot of grief for getting rid of the supersized soda, but, I mean, at least there was a commitment there to try to mm. improve the general health you know, at, at a younger age, so hopefully it would transfer and, and carry on in later life. We need to probably do more of that, don't yeah, you Yeah, I mean, and it's, it is a quandary because if you look at the how cheap processed foods are and you look at the economics of a single-income household, single mother of three, um, you think she's going to go into the Safeway or Albertsons or Fresh Food and, get and walk food. around the outside of the the grocery store right. where all the fresh foods are, and it's also expensive. And then go home after working two shifts and put together a hot meal for the family, or getting to drive through McDonald's and getting a couple well, of happy. Speaking meals. of McDonald's, I just saw a commercial on the, this weekend when I was watching one of the football games where they have the one, two, and three dollar meal now. Right. And the dollar meal is like I don't know a chicken fried chicken sandwich. I don't know if that's one of their healthier meals or not. And it's a buck. And one of the commercials, the guy walks in and says, give me 10 which is only $10. Right. You know, and that, of course, sends a powerful economic message, but the wrong kind of health message out there. It does. And, you know, I think a lot of those mm. solutions when it comes to um, eating right and getting affordable, uh, nutritious foods in front of kids, is, has to be, there has to be local solutions. We need, right. we need more um, great um, what's the name of the, I just met with them last week. It's the community gardens. Mm-hmm. Uh, we need more community gardens. Right. We need to educate. Oh, so, like the. Um, Garden City Harvest. Yeah, Garden yeah. City Harvest. Yeah, we need, we need those on steroids. Cooperatives. Our, we do. Well, one thing that at least dissuades me from making the worst possible choice when I'm eating out is the fact that in, on a lot of menus now, quietly, they have the calorie count. Or the or which the fat great. count, which is really well. The more you back to being well informed, right, and being right. the more you know. But tell us, like, what's the first? Who's the partner that the patient has in the community to to live a healthier lifestyle, um, to be more accountable? To your point, like, what's the like? You know, I, who I, do I talk to? Yeah, there there are many and multiple, especially in communities like Missoula, mm-hmm. where we have such a a uh, charitable and community-minded uh, mm-hmm. culture. 
Um, I would, you know, I would really like to have sat down and researched that because if I mention one, there's going to be 10 that are going to be sure. off that I didn't mention them. But we, there are a lot of resources in this community. And quite frankly, I think that the public schools are really starting to step up. You know, a lot of public schools across the U.S. cut P.E., Mm-hmm. I mean, you want to talk about just a wrong a step in the wrong <laughs> direction. Health pays. And art. Health pays. H- pays differently. Right. Staying out of the hospital, staying, you know, keeping yourself healthy is economically a very, very smart sure. thing to do. So I think it starts in the schools. It starts in the homes. But there mm-hmm. are lots of community resources out there when it comes to helping families uh, tap into affordable uh, food options. And one of the things that you said to me in a previous prior conversation was you were talking a lot about um, somebody's uh, going to the gym, they're, uh, you know, uh, a- exercising, taking the, ac- you know, being proactive, finding a good um, a trainer like you did, Arnie. Mm-hmm. And those are the people that are your first line of defense to help live, leave, or live a healthier lifestyle versus going to the doctor. I mean, you know, you're going to see the doctor once a year. This is something you're going to see three times a week, potentially. Sure. Right? Well, and, I, I, and if you'll go back to what I said, when I listed my primary health care providers, the second person on the That's list right. was my wife. Right. Okay. Because when she goes to the grocery store, what she buys and what she, what we decide collectively to put on the table for our family is yeah, right. front and center to a healthy lifestyle. <laughs> yeah. And those and those are you know, I hope those you're are listening th- to this, honey. <laughs> <laughs> those are tough choices, right? Particularly as you pointed out, you're you're a working single parent and you don't want to come home and cook a meal and you know, this fast food the plethora of fast food places and the commercials and the coupons are all, you know, staring you in the face and it's so much easier to, you know, go through a drive through a taco bell and, or and there's, Kentucky and there's fried big chicken. money in treatment and there's big money in prescriptions. Well that's true too. I, I got misquoted when in my first role as a hospital chief exec, I got misquoted at this big interview on why we were investing so much in cardiac care. And uh, the quote came out in the front page of the business <laughs> section of the Sunday Tennessean. And it said, and I was, again, I didn't say this. It said, from our perspective, uh, cardiology is the future because Tennesseans love their fried chicken, cigarettes, gravy, and beer. (laughs) Jeff V, chief executive of the medical center. Nice. But when you think about it, what I said was, if you drive down Main Street America, look at what you're looking at and look at where people are going in and going out of. Sure. And those, you know, that is, that's not good for public health. It's one of the reasons why it's expensive. At some point in time, I do want to get back into some of the micro, macro level drivers of why we are the most healthcare, expensive healthcare system. Yeah, in the I, want, world. I was going to get back. Is, let me, let me, but first, let me ask you this: Is there a model in the in the in the world that that would that we ought to emulate or take a look at that gets most of it right? You know, that, that would fit here. There are some European models. Germany um, has a model where everybody is required to have insurance, and they have public and private. Right. What about uh, the actually, president's favorite place, Norway? <laughs> well, I, you know, I haven't studied theirs, but I do understand that they do, they certainly have better outcomes, uh, certainly than we do. But you know, the the thing is, is that this whole individual mandate and what's being debated in Congress, that it's somewhat a little ridiculous when you think about the notion of you have a car. I don't know if there's any states left that don't require you have insurance. Why? Because if you hit somebody else. Um, it costs that somebody else money, right? Mm-hmm. Not having health insurance is the same. Sure. It's the same exact. So the fact that we're having a debate around why, in my opinion, and again, this is not politically uh, very um, favorable but or popular, but everybody should be required at some level to have some level of insurance, period. It's not going to work without everybody in the system. Well, of course, because then you get a skewed pool, right? That's exactly right. And then the costs just keep going up. That's right. So why is our life expectancy in the U.S. ranked so low? I mean, you would think with all that, putting aside the cost and all those other things, we have great emergency care, we have all great doctors. We're 26 in the world. We, you know, the average life expectancy here is, is, is two years below the uh, you know, European you know, averages. Why is that? I think, first and foremost, it's the American lifestyle. You go to Europe, what do people do? Well, they walk a they lot. They walk a lot. They bike. They even smoke. Yeah, but they walk, walk a lot. Right. And they're much more conscientious. You don't see the proliferation of fast food and processed foods in European countries like right. here. Mm-hmm. Well, I've never been with, to anybody there who would get in a car and drive six blocks. Right. They would always walk. That's exactly right. I mean, it, was, it would be insane of them. First of all, they couldn't find a place to park. Right. <laughs> but, I mean, they all walk. They walk right. and so less pollution, too. 
Sure. So that's right. Works both ways. Another ex- another is is that when we built, and again, I can't answer why we built it or how it got built this way, but we built the finest rescue care system in the world. We did not build a healthcare system. Mm-hmm. When you look at the other con- developed countries that have accomplished these these, all we're be- we're being measured on rescue. We're being measured on public health factors, infant mortality, life expectancy. When you look at some of these other developed countries that have figured it out, the number of social workers that they have embedded in the healthcare system is a significant magnitude more than what we have here. Because when you look at health overall, it's not just about the healthcare delivery system, the social determinants of health. Your sure. genes, where you grow up, what you were exposed to, what kind of diet that you have, what neighborhood do you live in, what kind of crime rate are you exposed to, what's your water situation. I, that would be one of the things that I would like to see happen um, on, on steroids is a proliferation of that type of uh, – that when we start talking about a shift towards primary care, real primary care where the physicians actually have time to really understand what's going on and they actually treat the root cause of the problem. Is there something to be learned from what the campaign in the U.S. to stop smoking? I mean, that's been pretty effective overall. It's rare now that you see somebody – pop out of a meeting to go smoke a cigarette. Right. Is there something we can learn from that to, to apply to, you know, more preventative, uh, you know, medicine, to the opioid epidemic, to some of these other things that are going on? Yeah, I do think that there's definitely some lesson learned. One of, the, uh, one of our uh, donors, more significant donors um, to our foundation when I was at St. Pat's, um, was very passionate about this particular subject and basically said, if you think that the war on tobacco was a big deal, wait till we take on the war on sugar. Yeah. And to me, when you start looking at um, processed foods and things that we're putting in our body, I mean, how do you take on Coca-Cola and when? Um, so mm. it's a, you know, and I, I'm from the South, and so everything's a Coke. Right. You know. But even Coca-Cola has shifted a little bit. They bought the Sante water. I mean, they moved into bottled Absolutely. water. They're now changing their Diet Coke and changing the formula, and they're, they're trying to smaller bottles. Now. I mean, they're doing, other, they're doing some things to respond <laughs> to the— uh, They are, but I mean, my, I'm just responding to, if you really want to look at major public health factors, try to eat something on a consistent basis that doesn't have processed sugar in it. Mm-hmm. And that, I mean, that has a significant impact on the health and wellness of well, the American population. What's interesting about that is that I don't know, again, comparatively the, the mortality rates. If you're in Europe and Asia, and I, you and I and, and Scott travel a lot, they eat much less processed sugar than we eat on a regular That's basis. That's right. You know, they have bread and cheese and wine, and they, mm. in Asia they have rice. I mean, but there's, there's no snacking. There's virtually no snacking. They sell the stuff, but you never see anybody eating any right. of it. You know, and we're just focused on that more than, you know, anything else. The, the, uh, the snacking and the grazing. Also stress level, right? I think stress level. Well, that's something to do with, too. We work, I mean, most people think in America, well, maybe we're not the hardest workers, but we certainly put in more hours Weird. per capita on, on jobs than almost any other developed country in the world. Right. And talk about mental health, right? I mean, like some people actually not even considering that a health issue for right. a long time. Now it's a real problem. I mean, and everyone is being, you know, diagnosed with either having bipolarity, you know, manic depression, mild depression, uh, ADHD, ADD. Well, that gets I back mean, to a little bit of what you were talking about, sort of a holistic approach. <laughs> the whole is greater than the sum of the parts. You can't just focus on one thing. You have to have, you know, the mental health component of it, the physical component of it, the stress component. All, all those pieces have to be addressed in, in some and way. And then talk about uh, drug abuse right. and addiction and alcoholism. And, you know, it you start... It roots in mental health. It really, it does. It's like, so we have to almost kind of take away some of the... Um, we have to have, educate more, right? Sure. I mean, that's what this is really all about. And I think one of the things we talked about uh, recently was... How technology um, married with knowledge and, you know, information can inform people better and they can make better choices. Yeah, if I have any positive outlook for healthcare, is that we're going to see tech start to positively disrupt um, healthcare in the United States. I'd like to see some free market disruption. So when you start thinking about the iPhone Mm -hmm. or smartphone devices, only 10 years old. And now you can literally go to a city you've never been to. It knows where you are. It tells you exactly how long it's going to take you to, to navigate this traffic, and it's right. We haven't even started 
truly integrating sensor technology mm. in with the smartphone device. When you fold in that coupled with genomics, coupled with artificial intelligence, it's going to be amazing. It's mm. going to be absolutely amazing to see what technology is going to be able to do to bring improved health care to us. The one, the one challenge is going to be is that we have to, because we are humans, and there truly is something to the human touch, we have to figure out a way to keep it from becoming true Star, star Trek medicine. Right, right. You have to keep that human element. You have to have the tactile connection you to do. human. Jeff, I, it's, after we spoke, I actually did a little research, and I was looking, and I'm like, all right, what's happening in the tech space, right? That are things that are happening that are only going to improve health. A couple of the key mergers... WebMD and internet brands, they're starting the information, right? The sharing of information. There's more of that that's happening. Fitbit, number two, Fitbit and Vector Watch. So the Fitbit, talking about the sensor, I mean, if everybody had a Fitbit and that data that came back was, you know, translated in a way that it was understandable. Oh, here's how many steps I took. Here's what my diet looked like. Here's what my heart rate is. Here's what my pulse. Think about it. The more information you have, the better educated you are. There's other ones. Um, I mean, some of these are really deep. Pocket RX. What is Pocket RX? I don't even know what it is. I don't know what that is. But I got to believe it's like, (laughs) it's it's trackability. I think it's the digital prescription manager. Well, obviously, more information quicker to the consumer, the patient. Or or less costly. I mean, one of the docs I work with has got a phone case that's got a sensor pad on the back of it. You can hand his patient and get get a directionally accurate EKG. Really? An EKG? Wow, With that's amazing. Directionally accurate. He's not going to debase really complex decisions. But it but gives you the... They, there's, there's a company out there that manufactures contacts that has a sensor in it that measures glucose level in your tears, and it's got a Bluetooth device that sends a message to your insulin pump and automatically manages... That's cool. That's coming. It's coming in big ways. And so I there are a lot... The nanotechnology is allowing those kinds, those kinds of things. That's exactly right. But even, even short of that... I'm always impressed. Again, uh, you know, with with Providence, I went and had a uh, you know a blood screen. I went to see my doctor for my annual. He says get a blood screen. I go get a blood screen at ten o'clock in the morning, two o'clock in the afternoon. I get a text, uh, me- an email you're message. On my chart. Yeah, I'm on my chart. You can go look at, it and it tells you whether you're in the normal, right. you know, range. And then you know later in the day, I get a phone call from the doctor's uh, you know personal assistant or PA, whatever, saying you know your results came back normal. If there's any questions you have, I mean that stuff is very helpful and and helps you inform you know what. Whether you're going to eat a pizza later in the day or not. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. <laughs> it's interesting. Alphabet, which is the parent of Google, right. and Synosis, the pocket-sized biomarker monitor, kind of like what we were talking right. about. I mean, it, this is, it is technology that's going to... But, it's but, transformed every other industry. Right, but what's interesting, or maybe to me sadly, <clears throat> you have all of these innovations happening in one area, and then the system itself is not is broken. Right. You know? One of the things that kept me up at night is just how capital intensive running a hospital is. And if you look at the case study of Blockbuster, what happened, I mean, here was oh, a Wall right. Street darling, very, very bricks and mortar strategy. Then out of nowhere, Netflix comes along, and literally overnight, Blockbuster is non existent. Right. I think there's one store left somewhere up in Alaska. And you, I mean, if the healthcare industry doesn't start thinking about how it can positively disrupt itself, they are going to do. Right. They they may very well become the next blockbuster. We can't get rid of hospitals for the sole reason of emergency departments, trauma, complex high end procedures, and managing really complex medical care. But the hospital ten years from now is going to be taking care of a very different patient set than they're currently today. The margins that we I used to make are all in the stuff that can be done. Outside the hospital. Sure. Like urgent care? Like these urgent care facilities? Outpatient imaging. Oh. Outpatient surgery. Mm. Those are where there's a lot of margin in those. And those things can be done in a lot more cost-effective setting than being done in a hospital center. But the nature of the hospital, because of the cross-subsidization of services, my trauma program costs me money. Well, i got to make it somewhere else. Mm. That's part of the problem is just how the economics... Sure. You need to pay the hospitals mm. and keep the hospitals open for what should be done in hospitals. The rest of it, and this is my personal opinion, you let the free market mm. free come up with – because the free well, market, that's where the consumers start actually shopping again. Right, they win too. There right. are other models. I know, for example, in France, they have a clinic system that handles lots of things that are separate from a hospital. Right. Hospital has a much more you know in-depth 
you know, a technical or maybe seri- more serious injury or serious disease focus. And clinics take care of a lot of other things. So there's a there's a layer of, uh, you know, they're already outsourcing from the main central, you know, hospital model to, a, you know, a, a more disparate model. That's exactly right. You know, and also we had, we had a show on cryptocurrency and blockchain technology. But blockchain technology, as it applies to healthcare, and, you know, speed of transactions and speed of, of sharing information will have, a, a you know, a huge effect on how things are, are done in the future. Yeah, yeah and I do. And, and sh- please shut me up if I'm, um, if I'm going too long on this. But the one important point that I failed to make earlier when it comes to the overall cost of the health care, and it's extremely um, not politically um, popular. Right. And it's part of the reasons why we're probably not going to see anybody running on a platform because they'll never get elected. Sure. Let's say you manufactured picnic tables. And your cost, your true cost of manufacturing a picnic table is 100 bucks, But you have to sell 70% of your, your picnic tables at 70% of your cost. So you're losing $30 <laughs> on Once, every single picnic table. Right. Except for the the other 30%. So what happens to the cost of the picnic table for the remaining 30%? It's a very expensive picnic table. And so, but, and then what happens if the people that you're selling at, 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 at the loss triple in size? Right. So what happens to the 30%? Medicare and Medicaid don't cover the cost. Hospitals. Mm-hmm. We're getting ready to see a massive explosion. So what Medicare do you do ranks. about that? This is the piece that... You have to talk about Medicare reform. We're well, putting and in of course, 35- then politically, that's like a death sentence. You're talk- well, you're talking the death penalty comes right. Up. Yeah, we're putting in thirty-five thousand dollar valves in eighty-nine year old people to extend their life by a year, <laughs> and we're denying kids access to basic primary care and dentistry. Mm-hmm. As a society, where's the logic in that? That's a good place to pause, and we're going to take a quick break. <laughs> Um, our guest is Jeffy. You're listening to What Do You Know on News Talk KGVO, proudly supported and sp- or supported and sponsored by Angle and Volker's Luxury Real Estate. Back after this. All right, we are back. How how do you put a sy- system together that makes compassionate and yet reasonable decisions on this? Uh, I don't. I mean, the, with the American political situation, I don't know how. You do that. I mean, but if you look at some of these developed nations that have got better public health outcomes than we do, um, they, you know, if you're over a certain age and you need a total knee, they're not saying you can't get one. They're just saying the, the government's not going to pay for it. Right. They can't afford to pay for it. And, and at some point in time, it gets back to this whole conversation around being a productive member of society. And some of these countries have, they invest in the future, not in the past. That's a tough, that is a tough, tough, tough conversation to have. Sure. Because anytime you start limiting resources um, and rationing resources, because at the end of the day, part of the problem with American health care is we haven't admitted to ourselves that we have a budget, that we have limited right. resources, and we can't afford this. We talk about not being able to afford it, but it continues. We're not going to get really at meaningful change unless we start having these meaningful conversations. And the meaningful conversations have to start around the, pick, the, the, the dinner table. Well, and they're tough conversations. And, they also, tough conversations. and they also have class implications. Because as you're saying, if you're a rich person and the government's not going to pay for it, you go to the private system. If you're a poor person, you don't get it. That's right. You know, and, and you know, is that fair? Is that, what, is, that, is that within the purview of what a government should do for for all of its citizens discriminate by class essentially right. tough decision it is wanna, a tough question i want to talk i want to move for a minute in the few minutes we have left what are you doing now post uh you know being a hospital administrator you got something interesting you're, you're working on well first and foremost uh, i spent 16 years trying to figure out a way to get to montana and, uh, <laughs> i have no intention or desire to leave i love this state and i love my community um, where I am focusing my intentions on, I've got uh, a company that I've started, Fence Line Enterprises, and our the areas that we're focusing on is that it's in the healthcare space, and it's in the positive disruption of healthcare space. Anything that can offer a different solution that, that will improve the patient experience, or it'll do some of the things that we were talking about mm-hmm. in terms of offering some positive disruption, because it needs to be disrupted. If it's not going to happen in Washington, 
it's going to happen somewhere because people mm. fundamentally are not going to put up with the mess for much longer, especially when other solutions present themselves in the marketplace. And as big as the marketplace is, there's a lot of really smart people out there looking uh, to deploy new technologies and new care models. One of the models that I'm currently working on is in that functional medicine space. Mm -hmm. It's trying to create a business model that gives physicians that want to practice functional medicine. And functional medicine really is a type of medicine where you focus on the root cause of the problem, not just treating the symptom. And it's a very integrative approach that encompasses Western and Eastern medicine and encompasses other integrated practitioners and encompasses mental health. Because in the absence of it being comprehensive, you're only, you're, again, you're only getting at the symptom. You're not fundamentally treating the, the, uh, the cause. So, and it's a free market solution, it, um, and that's currently what we're trying to, tr trying to figure out if we can be able to do. Wouldn't it be great if, if uh, one of the requisites for having, you know, health care is that the first interaction you have is with a, a counselor or a case manager that views things in, in a functional, a holistic way, that everybody is required to do that as an, as an access point? Yeah. And then, you know, it, it would probably in the long run you know, solve a lot of the, uh, you know, issues that we're, we're dealing with right now. There's actually a couple of companies out there that have an intake process where they've automated it and mm -hmm. they take all this information and they're actually, where they want to go with it is even looking at where you grew up and what kind of chemicals you were exposed to based right. upon the manufacturing plants that were in your protective perspective area. Right. I think what's, I think what's missing in general is, as you know, when, when you sign up or you go to your, your, your primary care physician for the first time or your hospital, you fill out 10 pages of stuff about your life, but nobody ever refers back to it again, really. They say, so what are you here for today? Right. Well, I'm here because my, you know, I'm, I have a nosebleed or whatever. And then they've, and I, you know, you just assume they're using that in case to help resolve the problem you're in for rather than to look at you as a whole human being and sit down and say, these are the things we need to be focused on. That's exactly right. If you think about it, the craziness is how sophisticated medicine is in the United States in terms of the, mag the MRIs, the surgical techniques, the surgical robots. In Western Montana, we moved to an electronic medical record in 2013. Mm. Wow. And so it was on paper. <laughs> right. How crazy is that? No, it's totally crazy. Well, well we're excited yeah. to see where things go. We'd love to have you come back on as the healthcare system meanders on its crazy course and, and revisit some of these issues again. And it's been great uh, chatting with and you. And the name of the company is Fenceline? Yes. Okay, very good. Great. It's that named after my favorite mountain bike ride in the Rattlesnake. <laughs> is that right? Is there a website we can go to? Uh, it's under development. I've put more of my effort in terms of getting the business <laughs> offline than, than, than marketing myself. Well, Got as soon it. as it's up and running, we'll, uh, we'll uh, have you back to talk Thanks, about Jeff. it. Thanks, Jeff. Very good. No, thank thank you. you. Appreciate it. Okay, we'll see you soon. Arnie, I'll see you next week. Next week. Live a healthy week. Thank you for listening to What Do You Know? I can't wait for the next show, Scott. I'm excited too, Arnie. If you'd like to suggest a guest, send me an email at scottrichman at townsquaremedia.com. We'll see you next week. And thanks for listening to News Talk KGVO.